I have a riddle for you. Let's see if you can solve it. It's not a super funny riddle, so bear with me, okay? <laughs> a father and son are in a horrible car crash, and tragically, the dad dies. The son is rushed to the hospital. As he's wheeled into the operating room, the surgeon looks down and says, stop. I can't operate on this boy. He is my son. How can this be? Exactly. The surgeon was his mother. Isn't that interesting? If you got the riddle right, you are among very, very tiny few. In a group of 200-ish undergrad students at Boston University, only 14% got the riddle right. Out of a group of youth age 7 to 17, 15% got the riddle right. I got the riddle wrong in a woman's studies class as a feminist when I was at the University of Michigan. Why? Because the mind models that we have about doctors and surgeons is that they are male. And these mind models, these things that we use to sort the barrage of information that come through our senses, they're neither good nor bad, they just are, but they're really powerful. So powerful that some of the answers that people gave included the dad, maybe he was a robot in the car, or maybe the dad was actually a father or a priest. Isn't that great? I mean, it's just wild. Even students whose mothers worked out of the, outside of the home got the riddle wrong. Even students whose mothers were doctors got the riddle wrong. That is the power of mind models. And a riddle that I have been pondering since I was a young woman in high school is the riddle of women's leadership. A riddle that confounds both men and women, and a riddle that's going to take all of us, both men and women, to solve. When I was in high school, I was a soccer player, not particularly skilled, but I played with a lot of heart. I mean, I left it all on the field. And one day, we were playing this team, we came in as the underdogs, and it started to rain, which really puts a dampener on all the girls with the fancy soccer skills, and I just emerged on the scene. I was fantastic. <laughs> and I rallied my team, and ultimately, we won. Um, and so at the next practice, my soccer coach, he commended me for what he called leadership skills which no one had really ever used on me. And he gave me this poster. It was this Nike poster with a swoosh on it. It said leader. It had this really inspiring set of words underneath. And I hung it in my bedroom wall. And I read it. And I read it. And even though my coach had told me I was a leader, even though I had clearly demonstrated leadership skills, and even though I was a co-captain on the team, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel like me. Because just like the mind model of surgeons, the mind model that we have about leadership is highly gendered male. And not just any male, white males, able-bodied males, males who come from relatively privileged socioeconomic backgrounds, males who look a lot like my husband, actually. We like him tall, I mean, I do. About six <laughs> feet, maybe six two, handsome. But actually, that's, that's proven to be true. There's privilege around what we look like. So it is any wonder that as a young girl, when we take this model of leadership that is so gendered, I mean, even the language we use around leadership, they're bold and decisive, they make tough decisions, they tell people what to do. Is it any wonder that we experience dissonance, not just ourselves, but the rest of society? I am a longtime leadership educator I have been at Colorado State University for almost 20 years. And during that time, I have taught leadership classes, I have developed leadership curricula, and I have participated in leadership studies. And one study that was really fascinating, it was about 10 years ago, it was called the Multi-Institutional Study of Leadership. And that study was designed to figure out how best to develop the leadership capacity of college students. And it went out to thousands of students across the country, asking them, how often do you do different leadership skills like collaborate, communicate through conflict, et cetera? And I remember getting the reports back, and I was intrigued to see that the women said that they were participating in these leadership skills and activities at a much higher rate than the male students. 
And not only that, they were reporting that they were using what are proven awesome leadership skills much more than the male students. And I thought, oh my gosh, this generation has got it figured out. And then I started flipping through the report and I came across this concept called leader efficacy. It's similar to self-efficacy. It's how much we believe in our ability to succeed as leaders. It determines whether or not we pursue leadership positions. It determines whether or not we persist through leadership challenges. It determines whether or not we even see ourselves as leaders in the first place. And on this construct, it bottomed out. Compared to the men, the women were in the basement. So what we had here were women who were reporting using leadership skills but didn't believe in themselves as being capable of success as leaders. And then male students who were reporting, no, I don't really do these leadership skills, but I, I think I'm going to be an awesome leader. <laughs> Women's lack of confidence is nothing new. Men's overconfidence is nothing new. But I want to emphasize that these students, they were young. They were age 18 to 22. They had yet to step foot in a corporate boardroom. They had yet to face the conflicting demands that derail so many women, the conflict of work and family. They had yet, for the most part, to experience gender bias and gender discrimination. And somehow they had learned not to believe in themselves as leaders. Cheryl Sandberg is the chief operating officer of Facebook. And she was one of the first to publicly name this phenomenon, this hesitancy to lean in, as she called it. And the numbers support her assertions. Even though women make up half the population, we're actually graduating in larger numbers than men. Even though women hold the majority of professional level jobs, we are incredibly underrepresented as leaders. In Fortune 500 companies, which are the 500 most powerful companies in the nation, if not the world, women make up 4% of the CEOs. Women hold 19% of executive level jobs in our US Congress. Women hold 20% of elected positions. Even in female-dominated professions like education, we are outnumbered at the leadership level. I have never had a high school principal or an elementary school principal or a middle school principal of my kids be anything but a man. And when I looked it up, 30% of high school principals in the US are female, that's it. And while there are certainly external barriers at play, and those are things that we must continue to push to change, there are significant internal barriers as well. And these internal barriers are the things that women like Sheryl Sandberg and women like myself are starting to speak up about and to challenge. And I'm doing it in a bit of a creative way. I've opened a school. And I'm teaching women science. The science of women's leadership. I start out with neuroscience to explain fear because it turns out that women are afraid to lead and have really good reasons, but they are afraid to lead. And this fear starts young. Just last week, I saw a number that caught my breath. One in three girls are afraid to lead. One in three girls that came out of leanin.org. Well, the brain on fear is a little messy. For those of you who are not familiar, the prefrontal cortex, which is our most highly evolved part of the brain, starts to shut down. And that survival insect, that reptilian brain, that is all about running away, laying on the floor and playing dead, you know, fighting back, that comes to the fore. That make, starts making all of the decisions. And while there are fewer and fewer physical threats that we encounter in modern society, psychological threats are quite real and that little reptilian brain can't tell the difference. Fear is fear. So what's an example of a psychological threat? Public speaking, doing TEDx talks. Can I just tell you how terrified everyone has been in the back here? I mean, I was meditating and chanting. We're all terrified. We know that people are more afraid of public speaking than death. Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, even said that, uh, it's kind of hilarious, at a funeral people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> and there are all these mind tricks to make you less afraid of public speaking, like picturing 
everyone in the audience in their underwear, which I'm totally not doing right now. <laughs> so what fears do women face when it comes to leadership? Well, well fears related to their identities specifically stereotypes about what it is to be female and what it is to be a female leader. And for that, I turn to another science, social psychology and the work of Dr. Claude Steele, who pioneered the study of stereotypes and their impact on performance. Stereotypes are mind models, they're generalizations, they're very negative typically. And what he found is that when someone with a stereotyped identity goes into a situation that brings that stereotype up, they experience incredible fear. It's called stereotype threat. It causes us to become hypervigilant, to second guess ourselves, to get stuck in our minds, and at worst, to choke. So what are the stereotypes that women are facing? That's a whole other TED talk, but I'll just do a couple real quick. So the stereotypes about women are that they're not quite as intelligent as men, they're too emotional, too soft. The stereotypes about women leaders are on the other end of the spectrum. They're pushy, aggressive, or worse. You can't really win. So when you take this idea of leadership, for me to be a good leader, to be sort of masculine, I am a bad woman. And if I am a good woman, I am a bad leader. It is an impossible dilemma, and it causes enough fear in our brains for us to lean out. Stereotype threat is like swimming with sharks. Not actual real sharks, but the fear of sharks. I personally am terrified of sharks. I don't know about you, but if you were raised during the 80s and your parents let you watch Jaws, you too probably have a healthy regard for sharks. I was so terrified as a child that I would put my face mask on and look in the water before getting in. And 30 years later, I'm still afraid when I jump in the water, whether it's a freshwater lake in Vermont or the deep end of the swimming pool, I feel it. And heaven forbid I have to go to that, you know, near the actual real ocean, which I had to when I honeymooned in Hawaii, which as you know is surrounded by sharks. So I did all this research about sharks. How many fatalities in the last 10 years? It's very low for those of you who are also afraid of sharks. And I mustered all my courage, and my husband was so sweet, and he encouraged me, and I went in about this deep, which is all you have to do to snorkel, and I made sure he was with me because I figured a shark would much rather eat a 200-pound man than me. And while he's tootling around and trying to point out the colorful fish, I'm trying to hold really, really still, which is super hard when you're swimming, and we are having completely different experiences in the same ocean, and the same ocean. We can say that is true for women who are in leadership positions or thinking about leadership positions. They are having vastly different experiences. What it looks like is hesitating to talk during meetings. It looks like not raising your hand for a, a challenging assignment not advocating for yourself for a promotion or a raise, not applying for a job. Have you heard this, this awesome doozy of a number? Women feel they have to have 100% of the job qualifications before they apply. Men, 50%. What? <laughs> so what if women weren't afraid to lead? What if women were taught not only how to lead, to but to believe in themselves as leaders. Well, the beautiful thing about science is that in addition to using it to understand our world, we can use it to change our world. And I have two strategies, and they apply to both men and women. The first is to focus on your values, and I'm not being trite here. Values are as salient as your personal identity. Think about this, people live and die for their values. And the research on stereotype threat shows that if you focus on your values, it's like a shield. It's an identity shield. It protects you in those threatening environments. So I tell all women to reflect on their values before they do anything that scares you. That's what I was doing in the back, reflecting on my values. The second is to be brave, to take small actions 
This is basic cognitive behavioral therapy. <laughs> Take small actions. Dip your toe in the water. Snorkel with the fish. See that it isn't filled actually with sharks. They're a pretty little fish. And you will become more and more brave. And eventually, you will be able to swim with sharks, which I am able to do now. Granted, they were nurse sharks, and they were at the bottom of the ocean, and those are like pet sharks, but a shark is a shark, nonetheless. <laughs> Men, same thing. Focus on your values. This conversation isn't about men versus women. Are women leaders better than male leaders? This conversation is about diversity, inclusion, equality, equity. Use those to guide your actions. Be like my soccer coach and blow women's mind models of leadership by telling them that they are leaders. Blow the men's mind models too while you're at it. Be like my husband and encourage. Know that they are having, women are having vastly different experiences than men. Hire women, promote women, give women raises, put women in leadership positions, and even better yet, allow yourself to be led by women. And finally, be brave, because if we are going to dismantle these external barriers, things like gender bias, gender discrimination, sexual harassment, only you can do that. Only you can do that. So use your values and be brave in those spaces. This riddle of women's leadership is simple. Women already are leaders, and they are incredible leaders. The challenge, the riddle is how do we get them to believe it, and how do we get society to believe it? And we do that by focusing on our values and by being brave. Thank you.